Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and all major podcast providers. So if you can't catch the show live, you can download it or simply use our free podcast player, which is available on our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to connect with us, please post a question on our wall on Facebook or send me a tweet at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Austria's Finest Naturally, Authentic Pumpkin Seeds, and Pumpkin Seed Oil from the Steiermark, available at OrganicUniverse.com. Listeners of the Organic View can receive $1 off their purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. For other promotional offers, please visit the OrganicView.com's website. On today's show, my special guest co-host, Colorado beekeeper Tom Theobald, and I will be joined by Mr. Tim Tucker, who is the president of the American Beekeeping Federation. We indeed have quite a show today. Some of the topics we're going to discuss are the EPA's Pesticide Program Dialogue Committee webinar, the emergency registration for clothianidin in citrus, and also how Bayer intends to tackle something called sudden death syndrome. But first, I'd like to welcome to the show my favorite beekeeper in the world, Mr. Tom Theobald. Good afternoon, Tom. Good afternoon, June, from snowy Colorado. And I would also like to welcome to the show our very special guest today, Mr. Tim Tucker. Welcome to the show, Tim. Thank you, June. Uh, We're here in very cold, brisk southern Kansas, but it's not snowing, so we're better off than you are, I guess. Well, welcome to the show, Tim. Could you please just take a moment and share with our listeners a little bit about yourself as well as your organization? Well, uh, the American Beekeeping Federation has been around for about 77 years, and we've been representing the American beekeeper um, uh, his needs and interests and education and legislation, um, both on state and national levels. Uh, we attempt to um, um, inform and, and, and keep our, our membership well advised of all of the things that are going on in, uh, in D.C. and that might affect them. And I have been the president for a little over a year. I was just reelected for my second last year, uh, recently in January. I've been a beekeeper since 1991, and prior to that, I was in the pest control industry for 18 years and um, ran my own company for about eight years in Topeka, Lawrence, and Kansas City, Kansas. So I've had a long experience with bees and honeybees um, from both sides, uh, managing them as a pest from a pest operator's uh, standpoint, and then trying to... Uh, trying to make a, a honey crop and keeping bees alive for the last 23 years. So it's been an interesting uh, uh, association with the honeybee for me. Well, thank you so much, Tim, and it's really great having you on the show today. Now, as we get on to our program... This Week in Aggravation. I just love that. The first topic is EPA's Pesticide Program Dialogue Committee webinar. Tim, what did you think of the webinar? Well, I'm uh, I'm always a little bit frustrated with the things that get, that go on at EPA, and of course, we never get everything we want uh, from that side of the um, uh, uh, argument. But uh, we, I think, we in the labels, uh, the revisions. Uh, some things will be good, some things won't, but I don't think in the end it's going to really protect uh, not just honeybees, but the things uh, that we worry about as well are the native pollinators that um, really are taking it on the chin as well. Uh, most people don't have a, a real good understanding for, you know, the other insects maybe other than monarch, monarch butterflies that we all know are down 90% in numbers, but here in Kansas, we're south of 100 million acres of corn, the corn belt uh, that lies north of us and east of us, and 60 million acres of soybeans. And uh, our native pollinators are, are insects and our 
birds and our bats, our prairie chicken, our meadowlarks are all uh, down significantly in numbers in the last 15 years. So I don't know that the label, uh, new label guidelines are going to do anything for native pollinators. So uh, that's that's one of our major concerns. And of course, the new uh, coming out of the PPDC yesterday was also the um, the announcement of the uh, approval of 2,4-D uh, combo, you know, with uh, with glyphosate, which will uh, again just throw another. Uh, Factor or variable into the into the situation, which will you know not solve any long-term problems, but it uh, it again buys a few years uh, before we start encountering resistance with this with this product as well. So uh, June, again, what June? We, yeah, go ahead, Tom. Uh, June, there was a second webinar, and that's the one that Tim was a presenter in, and that was the one by the Environmental Law Institute. Ah, uh, yes. Um, and one of the things that we'd like to do this eve- this afternoon is uh, find out what his Tim's views were of that webinar specifically. Now, Tom, excuse me, before we go forward, Tom, can you just state the name of that webinar so that our listeners can also take a look at the organization and, and other presenters? It was the Environmental Law Institute. And I don't have the exact title in front of me, but it was it was addressing the effect of the neonicotinoids. It has had something to do with product stewardship, and uh, Tim may recall the exact title. I I don't. It had something to do with an uncertain future and re- and regulation, and uh, where do we go uh, from here with with science piling in every day? Um, in regards to the uh, the uh, long-term, you know, um, hazards that we're encountering with with the neonics that we didn't uh, expect 10, 15 years ago when they were first introduced. But uh, I thought the webinar went very well. Um, also presenting was Ray McAllister with Crop Life, uh, presenting the other side of the story uh, along with Tom Moriarty. Uh, who's uh, head of risk assessment at EPA, and um, uh, also Lorianne Bird with the uh, Center for Biodiversity, who ended up the hour I started and Lori ended, and I think um, all in all that I've heard was that uh, we made some very good points uh, for for bees and for the environment. Um, my my discussion was only 12 minutes. The presenters were allowed 12 minutes. And I started out by you know, pointing out that bees need several things to survive and thrive the way we used to see them do in the 1990s. Um, I was very fortunate to get into beekeeping at a time when it was easy to keep bees, and Tom remembers this as well, uh, when it was uh, managing bees was probably half or a third the effort that we have to put into them today. And... Um, and we saw good I don't like to admit every- that though, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, but, you know, we, we had good years, good honey production years when we produced 100, 100 pounds of honey per hive. And our last year of doing that was 1999. And since then, our crops have fallen to about an average of 40 pounds per hive. And you know that's just not a number that is sustainable for the industry uh, you know the industry's hit, hitting around 60 but in here in southern kansas and and many of the states surrounding us were were running in the 40s and uh, even at two dollars a pound that uh, you know that's only eighty dollars of production per hive which which doesn't cover the cost so the commercial beekeeping industry is really taking it on the chin and paying the price for four uh the use of these this, these compounds for the last 15 years, and um, unfortunately, the native pollinators are as well. Well, we've been depicted as sort of the miner's canary, and I think we are. And I've been pretty outspoken about what I think to be the magnitude of this crisis. I'd like to hear from your perspective just how serious do you think this crisis is for bees and beekeepers. Well, you know, a couple of years ago, I, I 
I was interviewed by Time Magazine on on an article they did about Jim Doan, and and I was kind of frustrated that having spent so much time with the reporter, he only reported on one quote uh, hmm. from me, and 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 but <laughs> that was that um, you know the bees will probably survive this. Uh, they are very adaptable. Uh, they've been here for a long time. They'll probably be here when we're not. But what's not going to survive is the commercial beekeeping industry. And unfortunately, you know, for America, so much of what we eat that's good and and uh, tasteful in our diet is produced by the bees, our fruits and vegetables. And, you know, without the the industry to provide bees for almond pollination, for seed pollination, uh, which a lot of people don't even begin to think about, um, you know, that that uh, production is going to drop and it's going to languish. So um, unless there's alternative methods developed, you know, like hand pollination like the Chinese are doing some of right now. but That's impossible really, in America. Yeah, it really is. With the with the number of acres that we have, it's not it's not really feasible anywhere. I don't I don't believe, especially with our our labor rates. But um, you know, it's it's totally devastating to the industry. I, I I one of my last slides was the cost of the commercial beekeeper. You know, things have to balance out in our in our economic system, and and now it's it's it, it's the advantage is in the producer end of this, the crop producer. And the native pollinators and the, and the commercial bee industry are really taking it on the chin, uh, I think, to the tune of $200 million a year or more in costs because our, there's a real coincidence between the uh, advent of, the, of these compounds in use and distribution and the decline in the American honey production. And... Over the last 15 years, our honey production has dropped 50 million pounds. Uh, that's a cost to the beekeeper if he's wholesaling all of his honey at two dollars or 2.20 a pound this year, of uh, you know 100 million dollars plus. Uh, if they retail it, you know, at five or six dollars a pound, who knows what the uh, the potential is there for dollars lost for beekeepers in dropping a quarter of our, our, our annual honey production from 200 million pounds to 146 million pounds last year. And then there's with this annual die-off of 30 to 50 percent, the continual cost of replacing bees, you know, at a cost of if you buy them in packages or nukes of 125 to 140 dollars a piece, uh, we're continually requeening our hives at the cost of, you know, 15 to 25 dollars a piece for queens. And the additional input to just keep bees alive today is phenomenal. So uh, if you figure the cost of replacement of 700,000 hives a year lost, and that's conservative because that's based on 30% of 2.2 million hives when we're probably losing 40 to 50 uh, throughout the course of the year, that, that adds up an additional 60 to $70 million. So along with the incidentals, I think we have a good case that be, the commercial industry is, is, uh, is paying the cost on this to the tune of $200 million a year plus. Yeah, and I think those figures are probably very conservative if we really had a closer accounting. Uh, there was something that came up in the, uh, the EPA webinar, the PPDC webinar, one of the earlier sessions was on a chemical called chlorpyrifos. Yes. And and I know you were working as you were listening, and what I picked up was something they were talking about, which was compensation for unexpected damages. Now, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's an interesting concept. I've said all along that these billion-dollar pesticides wouldn't be, not be nearly so profitable if these companies were uh, required to make uh, compensation for the environmental damage that they've caused. And so I think this concept of compensation for unexpected damages is something that we beekeepers need to take a much closer look at because we've just you're been right. eating it up until now. Yeah, you're exactly right. And, and um, you know, that is... It should be a part of the factor, just like 
the uh, cost of deconstruction of a nuclear power plant should be, you know, in the factor of the operating costs. And mm-hmm. uh, the, all the long-term costs and considerations should be involved when uh, people are putting things onto the market, especially uh, when they haven't been thoroughly proven to be safe uh, for the environment, that they do no harm to the environment. So, you know, the EPA is, is charged with that purpose and in the case of, of, of these compounds, um, you know, they, I, I don't know, it, it's, it, it's this, someone just dropped the ball on this, and it's not... But let me, uh, let me ask you both a question. I'm sorry, let me ask you both a question. If there were financial compensation for your losses, for the, for these bees that were killed, wouldn't that also be construed as acknowledgement that the neonicotinoids are to blame. Industry has been very, very aggressive as far as blaming beekeeping practices, saying, oh, it's it's what the beekeepers are doing. They don't know how to keep bees. And even with some of the the, the information that's coming out as far as the process um, for applying these chemicals, you know, the, the label, it's really not geared towards protecting the bees, but quite the opposite, don't you think? Yeah, and you're exactly right. There's kind of an omission of guilt there if you start, uh, you know, assessing and then paying um, actual damages. Um, so it's not it's not a condition that the industry I think wants to put forth um, because it does it does admit guilt or responsibility and, and then future responsibility. So. Um, I don't, you know, I, I don't know any easy way to do this um, because they're just not, they're not going to want to admit you in any way, shape, or form, or liability, or response. No, they certainly haven't up until now. I have to say, I listened to the uh, Environmental Law Institute webinar, and I came away with a little different impression, and my impression was that it was a little more subtle than previous efforts, but it was really an effort at industry propagandizing. It gave them the opportunity to present canned presentations in defense of what they've done. The moderator, uh, a man by the name of Idala, is uh, a former EPA manager now working for a company whose business is facilitating the registration of these poisons. He was the moderator. He introduced uh, Ray McAllister from Crop Life, not as Mr. McAllister or even Ray McAllister, but as Ray, you know, as in good old Ray. Um, you say that like it's a bad thing, Tom. Well, I think it is. I think that they're trying to justify what they've done. They're, these, And I've said it before. The poisoning that's gone on is the most massive in human history, and we're getting cover-ups and excuses and evasions, and I am having less and less patience for this all the time. I'm hoping that the Environmental Law Institute is perceptive enough to pick up on the fact that they've been used to a certain extent to advance the interests of industry. Nowhere did we talk about the law, Clothianidin, for example, one of the major neonicotinoids used as a seed treatment on hundreds of millions of acres, has never met the requirements for registration. Which actually brings me to the next topic, which is the emergency registration for clothianidin in citrus. Now, Tom, I know that this is something that you can speak very fluently about, uh, could you take our audience back in time and explain how EPA has handled clothianidin in the past? It's kind of a convoluted story. I'll try to do it as quickly as I can. I got on to this probably around 2007 when I began to see losses in my bees. And from what I understood of the systemic pesticides, I began to believe that, that they were the cause. And in 2010, I wrote an article for Bee Culture magazine in which I examined the challenges that we were up against. And clothianidin came on the market in 2003. It was the second of the major neonicotinoids. And it was given a conditional registration. And the condition 
was what was called the life cycle study or at the the Cutler Dupree study, and it was to examine whether or not the bees would be damaged by uh, seed treatment treatments with systemic pesticides, the neonicotinoids, clothianidin. It was the the contingency upon which uh, conditional registration was granted, and didn't it wasn't completed for years. I think 2007 was when it finally came out. The EPA sat on it for about 15 months, finally concluded that it was scientifically sound. And those were their words exactly, scientifically sound. Well, I wrote my article in 2010 uh, about the pesticide problems that we were facing. And in part because of that, when Bayer came back to the EPA to broaden the registration for clothianidin to include cotton, and mustard, the EPA scientists went back and they reviewed the Cutler-Dupree study and initially concluded that it was invalid. This was the conditional study upon which conditional registration had been granted in 2003. Um, Tom, can you just repeat that part about invalid? Repeat that just one more time because... their Their initial... decision on the Cutler Dupree study when they reinvestigated it was that it was invalid. Now, that never reached print because that was a little too rich for EPA management and that was watered down to supplemental. Supplemental. Basically, it means in terms of the registration worthless. Well, what has the EPA done? The EPA hasn't corrected their error of judgment. Instead, they've used their money and their resources to defend that action in court. And they're defending against a lawsuit right now, ongoing, been going on for the last couple of years. Uh, And that's part of the issue of that lawsuit, is whether or not clothianidin has ever been properly registered. It's been on the market since 2003 on hundreds of millions of acres, causing the very kinds of consequences that Tim testified to at the webinar earlier this week. And they continue to drag this out with all sorts of evasions and excuses. In any event, the Cutler Debris study basically put four colonies of bees on two and a half acres that had been treated with clothianidin. Those bees were free to roam over thousands of acres, and they most certainly did. The conclusion that Cutler and Dupree came to was that no problem. This didn't cause the bees any problem. But they did discover clothianidin in the bees and in the pollen and in their nectar, and that's the key data in this study, and they completely disregarded that. And that is that as little as that piece of real estate represented two and a half acres in thousands of acres, those bees still picked up that pesticide. Well, the the Cutler Dupree study was considered to be uh, supplemental and they were required to redo it. And now here we are, 2015, they're finally releasing what is the recreation of the Cutler Dupree study? This time they poured almost a hundred, almost a million dollars into it, and it basically does the same thing. It shows nothing. They claim that it shows that these chemicals are harmless to the bees. They show it shows nothing of the sort. And I don't remember all the details of the criticisms of this, but it's full of holes. It's a million. Do- it's not science. It's salesmanship. It's a million dollars in salesmanship. Now, Tim, considering your background, how do you feel about it? Well, you know, I uh, I have had a long career of exposure to the, um, the pesticide industry, having been in a uh, position where I actually purchased, uh, uh, well, um, everything from uh chlorinated hydrocarbons from uh, from uh, chloridane to uh to the newest uh family of compounds what we called uh, insect growth regulators in the 90s that that we thought were going to be the um, the uh end all cure all to uh our insect problems but um, you got sucked in everything, too, huh? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Everything we have seen, <laughs> everything we have seen come down the line uh, for the last 40 years has been, well, you know, these compounds are safe. Uh, here's the studies to show it. And uh, they will only persist for this long in the environment. And um, you don't need to be concerned. And what we always end up finding out in the long term, and it is always uh, the uh, people outside of the industry that are, are bearing the burden of proof that actually have to prove that these compounds aren't safe in every way that industry tells us, and that they do persist longer. That they, you know, we, what we're finding is is that, um, uh, like Tom says, these these compounds are six to ten thousand times more toxic than DDT. You know, DDT was the original number one uh, registered pest, pesticide. And, and it, everything is compared either negatively or positively to it in a less than or greater than uh, DDT in toxicity. And, and we all know the stories of, of DDT. Now, while they are completely different in their, in their, uh, in their application rates, uh, or methods rather, um, we have no doubt that 90% of these, these seed treatments are not staying on the seed. They are migrating to areas outside of these agricultural fields, and they're getting on the blackberries, they're getting on the sumac, all the trees, the elms and maples that are sitting along the edges and the river bottoms where crops are being grown. And we, we just really feel like, you know, they are last. We know that they're lasting longer than, than what was originally uh, released in the studies. Uh, by industry, that, and sometimes four to five, uh, six years longer than what uh, we were told. So they are bioaccumulating in the soils, and our concern is that, you know, do we need to keep putting compounds on top of co compounds when there may be enough there to provide protection for, for crops for two years? And we're very concerned about the small, minute effects on the bees and, and everything else in the environment, all the native pollinators, because it, it, it takes such small changes to upset these very critical balances. Uh, most people don't understand that bees communicate with chemicals, with pheromones. Uh, they're called semiochemicals. And upsetting that balance in the hive is is very easy to do, and we feel like you know, if the brood pheromones are upset or the queen pheromones are upset and are, they're not taking care of, the, care of the queens, they're not lasting as long as they used to 15 years ago. The bees are not living as long as they used to 15 years ago, and they're not as vigorous. And we feel that these natural chemicals that they used to communicate with are being affected even by very, very small amounts in the parts per billion uh, presence in the hives and also the bees ability to navigate and get back to the hive um, this last year we took a 38 percent loss again in our production hives uh, from our original 523 hives we're down 38 percent since September 1st and we saw bees swarming or leaving the hives in November now that is not a natural phenomena or instinctual uh, uh, activity for bees in November to just be abandoning the hive and something is going on that's upsetting this very delicate balance uh, within the colony within this these super organisms you know testing bees individually and killing a few bees or not killing a few bees with a certain amount of a compound really doesn't mean anything because bees can't live by themselves and they can only live as a unit of 30 to 60,000 bees and as a, as a single organism. So we, we just feel that you know, the industry has not, again, been forthcoming, just like with every other family of compounds, uh, that these, these pesticides are lasting much longer, they're bioaccumulating, they're, they're going to off-target species, and they're affecting everything that's in downwind of, you know, a corn planter or, or a soybean planter. And it's, it's not good. It's not good for anything. Well, I think the emphasis has been primarily on how much money industry will lose if neonicotinoids are banned in America. That seems to be the focus in Europe. And the bottom line is is that without the bees, we're not going to be eating. That's right. 
and it is billions. It's a billion. It's several billion dollars. Um, the um, estimates are that we use 350 tons, or 770,000 pounds, I think, is what the the num- last number that I saw of these compounds that are so far more toxic than anything we've ever used before. Yeah, if you consider the relative toxicity, it's the equivalent of literally tens, if not hundreds of billions of pounds of DDT. The highest right. level of usage for DDT was 1959, 80 million pounds. Seems like a lot, is a lot, but we're talking about the toxic equivalent of billions and billions of pounds of DDT. And we're getting excuses and cover-ups. Well, that's exactly what we're dealing with, and that's basically why we do this show each week is to educate people about what's going on because there's so much that's being hidden and kept from the public. And case in point, there's... Uh, there was an article that appeared actually today. Um, this is from agriculture.com, and it says Bayer rolling out new SDS seed treatment. Now, these chemicals are just going to keep cranking out, and, you know, it's great that they are coming up with solutions left and right. This particular article focuses on something called sudden death syndrome, which is a fungal disease that it says it popped up in quite a few Midwestern fields last year. And it says bear has enough levo for about 2 million acres this year. SDS can cause economic losses of up to 1 billion losses annually. And apparently um, they, it says this year Bayer is also having a limited launch in 2015 of its Levo seed treatment that can be teamed with Poncho Votivo. Now, Poncho, which isn't uh, that imidacloprid, Tom? Poncho, yeah, I think Poncho is imidacloprid. Poncho was the first. Right. Yeah. It was either Poncho or Gaucho. I don't know. You know, they have all these names. It's hard to keep them straight. Maybe Tim knows. No, I think it was Poncho. I think that's that, that's correct. And um, you know, the the thing that worries us with fungicides is that we're finding out that fungicide in combination with pesticides or IGRs can have synergistic effects that are even way beyond what either compound would express individually. And that's really disconcerting for for us when we start uh, mixing um, different types of, of, of pesticides, uh, insecticides with herbicides or fungicides. It it really adds to the the potential for for real synergistic issues. Tim, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us. We had a lot of important things that we didn't quite get to, and uh, maybe we can get to some of them next week. Thank you so much, Tim, for coming on the show today. It has been great having you on, and I hope you come back really soon. Glad to be here. And, folks, thank you so much for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon, everyone.